religion in this case is because this is what this was about, this exorcism of Emily Rose. What actually happened was these groups of spirits in the spirit world decided they wanted to make the Catholic religion more prominent. And these are very, very dark spirits who were Catholics when they were on earth. Right? And so what they did was they possessed a girl who was open to the possession of these spirits by saying that, and they possessed this girl, and then she eventually died from the possession. Right? And, uh, and you will see it depicted totally differently to what I've just said. I'm telling you what actually happened to Emily Rose. But what it's depicting is that, that Satan mm -hmm. inhabited her and it was done to help people become... It was done to generate fear so that people would go back to the Catholic Church and generate more interest in the Church. That was the motive of the spirits. That a girl died as a result. Now, her attraction caused that. And the reason why she was attracted to that is because she was totally open to spirit communication. And she was also totally open to the Catholic beliefs of good versus evil. You know, God versus Satan those beliefs and, um, and and because of that openness that created a lot of those attractions does that make sense yeah. what actually happened mm -hmm. now you'll see the movie and you won't get that out of it at all I'm just telling you <laughs> so the movie is totally different than what I just described Yes, and a lot of times it's not a malevolent spirit. It might be a spirit who's their guide trying to tell them, this is who I am. This is, this is my life. This is where I lived. And this is where, what I did when I was on earth. And, do you know what I mean? Just yeah. creating a rapport. But we interpret it as a past life, which is often, often the spirits who, who are with us trying to influence us in this way get quite frustrated that we interpret it as a past life. It's not, it's not all about you. Because they're saying, it's not, about, it's not you, it's not you, it's me, it's me. You know, it's, like, it's, it's my life, you know. I'm just trying to give you pictures and thoughts and frames and, and everything about me so we can communicate, so we can have a closer relationship, so you can trust me. Does that make sense? So, so the, there is dangers in past life regression. So, who's had past life regressions? Yeah, quite a few. There are dangers in past life regressions. The reason why there's dangers is because when you go to a past life regression therapist, there are literally hundreds of spirits surrounding that therapist wanting to express themselves through you. So when they put you into a hypnotic state, which is actually a mediumistic state, and allow the connection, any one of those spirits could actually connect with you and say what their life was. And if you then interpret it as a past life experience, right, then you will remain connected with that spirit probably. And if you stay that way for the rest of your life, you'll have all of these spirits connected to you for the rest of your life. Right? So my suggestion with past life regression is, remember, it's all about the emotions. Right? You're there because you've got emotions in you that subtracted these spirits with you. Right? And a past life regression isn't really past life regression, it is spirit possession. So how did you find out that you would use this if you didn't go through the regression or therapy? Well, bec because I'm, I'm not, don't need to go through, I'm having, I have the memories of who I am, just so like you do. you conclude do. that perhaps it's just a spirit attached to you? Oh, you could if, if you wanted to, yeah. Who is it attached to me? I know who it is. I was just going to ask, I've used past lives and the and karma associated with past lives to explain inequity on the planet. So it's like if someone comes in and they've got a crappy family and they get bashed and molested and mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff, then mm -hmm. you can say, well, that, that's a horrible thing, but I, I, I've always looked at it as they've got some sort of trapped emotion that they've held in their soul that they've brought in through mm -hmm. that life and that law of attractions for mm -hmm. that family situation around them, mm -hmm. which then causes that to manifest. So they're not these sort of like beautiful, pristine souls coming in. They still have mm -hmm. something in them that's causing that to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and so I could say, well, if there's been like a trail of lives where they've, had, they've been taking action, mm -hmm. come in, well, that would explain past lives.
can you see what it's really doing, though? What is it really saying about God? About God. Hmm. See, see I, I have a big, again, another four hour discussion about reincarnation, because it's a common belief, right? Reincarnation, as it's taught today, is saying a lot of very negative things about God, actually. See, what, what that is saying is that a person f do, has a life here on earth that they do some bad things. Right? They pass over to the spirit world and they can't deal with their stuff there, that's what it's saying. They have to actually come back to earth to deal with their stuff again. But when they come back to earth, they're coming back with all that damage. So what's that going to create? More damage. Is that, is that a good way to clear away <laughs> their emotion? Really? Right? Is it loving, even? Do you think it's loving? Do, would you do that to your child? Would you say <coughs> to your child, your child's doing some bad things. So would you say to your child, all right, you're going to die now and I'm going to send you right back and you've got to deal with all those bad things, but now you've got to deal with those bad things on top of the bad things. Right? And the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the truth is that when you talk to spirits, you find that every single spirit can progress in the spirit world without returning to earth. Now, if they can process their emotion without returning to earth, then why return to earth? And in fact, every spirit who's in the sixth fear knows there is no reincarnation, as described in this method. Because it's actually a very love, unloving portrayal of God. In fact, God would never, ever allow it. But then why is there so much injustice? On this? Why is there so much inequity? Why, why does that soul come through as it is? The very first emotion that Ammon and Amman, which are the first human couple, had, was that, self-reliance. The self-reliant emotion creates huge inequities and, and it walk, you walk away from God as soon as you become self-reliant. As soon as you become self-reliant and walk away from God, there is automatic things that are going to occur to the soul condition. And those soul conditions are going to then be impressed generationally onto the next generation and so forth. And that's how evil came about, is that we make, and how many of you today, right now, are still making the choice of self-reliance? It's one of the, it is, to be honest with you, it is going to be the biggest emotional damage that you will have to ever face in your life, that emotion. Because in the end, what, if we're on the divine path, we will be in a state of God-reliance. Uh, <coughs> right. So all emotional damage that is now on the earth has come about because of the emotion of self-reliance. What actually happened, and if I can explain what happened in the spirit world, because everything is a relationship between what happens here and what happens in the spirit world. So what happened was the first human couple made the choice of self-reliance. That then caused their emotional condition to degrade. When they passed, their emotional condition was degraded. You follow me? So when they passed over, they were in first fear emotional condition, degraded emotional condition. They then influenced the next generation of people through their emotional condition. Now, the next generation gets worse in terms of what they do, right, as a result of that. Then what happened was they passed, and they were in an even darker emotional condition, and they influenced the earth even darker places. But the first human couple by this stage had learnt a lot of their dark lessons and had progressed up the spheres a bit. Does that make sense? Now, the next generation passes, the next generation passes, and you think of hundreds of thousands of generations passing. There's this filtering going occur where eventually the first generation re reaches the spirit of natural love, the area of natural love, the sixth sphere. And they are now in a purely loving place from a natural love perspective. And then subsequent generations are now getting into that state. Now, what's happening now is there's a lot more positive influence on the earth. You follow? And that positive influence has then caused the earth to start improving in its condition. So what actually happened generationally was, firstly, we started off, we started off in a pristine condition, but not God-reliant. We degraded 
this is the entire human race degraded into this position of like, of in fact the Bible calls it lower than animals, right? And this is where all these historical skeletons come of man, you know, when man was in this terrible degraded condition. Because as you know, if you don't deal with your emotions, you have physical things happen to your body, do you not? Yeah. Yep. And if you don't deal with those emotions, and they're huge emotions, what's going to happen to your children? They're going to be born with these deformities, are they not? And, these, and so the, the, what happened was the, the man degraded in physical and emotional condition to the point of being little like animals, right? And then, because of the influence from the spirit world, positive influence, the, the, the man, man's soul condition started rising. What time was it? Uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, this, uh, hundred thousand years ago, right? Man degraded very rapidly, yeah. And by the time you know, within a few thousand years, man was in a state where they were just very much like warmongers, like we are today, generally. And um, but but much worse, without any law, right? And then and then that caused a uh, constant degradation. This point here sort of occurred around thirty-five thousand years ago. Right. You, uh, you've heard of, uh, you know, the sinking of Atlantis, the uh, Lemuria and those kind of continents. All of that occurred because of the soul condition being so bad on Earth, right? And, and so they caused all of these physical... The Earth itself responds to your condition. So, and then there was this gradual improvement over that period of time, 30, from 35,000 years to now. Spiritual improvement due to spirits reaching the sixth sphere of their development and others, you know, helping other people on earth and guiding other people on earth and helping them come to those enlightenment, you know, to some enlightenment. Yep. Can I ask you one more question about reincarnation? Sorry? Can I ask you one more question about reincarnation? Sure. Have you read the book Abduction to the Ninth Planet? No. This fella, um, in, I think it was 87, this French fella living in Cairns got abducted by this... Um, Highly spiritual, the most highly spiritual evolved and technological um, yep. species in our galaxy. And they yep. physically took them in to their planet. Yeah. And they talk about all this wonderful stuff, and very similar to the way you talk about um, the soul and twin soul, um, yep. all those sorts of things, and the um, material body and yep. all those sorts of things, um, and how there's different levels of existence on different planets. Yep. And can I describe what actually happened? Please. What actually happened was that the man had an out-of-body experience and he was taken to, and this happens by the way more often than what people realise, and they were, he was taken to a place where people could transmit truth to him. Right? And then in the process of transmitting truth to him, he could then relate that truth back on earth, write a book about that. This happened to Swedenborg in the, nine, in the 1700s as well. It's exactly what happened with him as well. He, was, he, he had the same kind of experience. He was more conscious of it because he was a spirit. He was used to spirit communication and spirit interaction and out-of-body experiences. But when you're out of body, your spirit body feels like your material body. You can touch it, you know, you can smell, you can you taste, you can do all the things that you would normally do here. Do you follow me? Yeah. So, so you don't you just not realize that the body that you're actually inhabiting is laying there on a bed or whatever and you're actually now in this form which is actually your spirit body form and you can get lots of education through that i think grant you were saying this morning that you that happened to you at the oneness university didn't it where you had constant out of body experiences were shown different things yes. yeah. yeah so that that happens constantly now a lot of what is portrayed as you know like other dimensions and other, a lot of it is actually uh, true. Like it's all, what I'm talking about, you know, the spheres I'm talking about, they are all dimensions. They are all <coughs> dimensions of existence, right? But they are dimensions of existence not in this physical form. They are in, a, in different <coughs> levels of physical forms. And the, like our spirit body is just another physical form. You follow me? So it would have been experience would have been so real for him that he would actually thought... No, the not so real. The experience was totally real. Like, I'm not... What I'm saying is that when you're in the spirit form experiencing something, you are experiencing it. It is no different than you having... In fact, it is more real 
than the experience you're having right now. Right? And in fact, almost every spirit you can talk to always say that when they pass, they feel more real than they ever felt before. And, that, and you will find exactly the same experience. You will feel more, once you pass, you will feel more real than you felt in this physical body. Yeah. Can I just so, say what, what happened? Yep. He was, um, he talks about Jesus and Moses. Yep. And he says that Jesus was, um, was one of the, was one of the species from their planet. And he was, um, impregnated into Mary. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Moses. And they got to the level where they can create physical bodies. Mm -hmm. So. It's a very, very intellectual and technical information. Um, but in the Urantia book, they relate some of those, it's a, a different sort of flavour, if you like, but similar types of things. It's not what reali in reality happened in my life, but it is what they believe happened in my life. And what they believe, it's not and what happened to Moses either, but because I've spoken to Moses, but they believe that it's what happened to Moses because they have never met Moses or myself. So they, what they do is they come up, a lot of six fear spirits come up with all these different definitions or explanations of how things happened, but a lot of them are not real. They, that's what they believe to be real. Right? And you can believe lots of things with your mind, but it doesn't make it real. There are truths in there, but, but again, it's all very physically oriented and, not, and it's not oriented around divine love. So there are certain truths in there. Yes, of course, like all of you at some point will get together tantrically with your soulmate, right? Oh, well, that's a totally different discussion. <laughs> you want to have that discussion now? sicknesses that you were talking about before and the spirits attached, right? Yep. If you get down to the emotions of that sickness itself, yep. can you break the nexus with the spirit that's attached and totally. that help cure them? Uh, it may not help cure them, but many of them are actually connected to you uh, in ignorance. Okay. And so when you actually work through the emotion that causes the disconnection, they then realise that perhaps they need to do the same thing. But, but whether they realise that or not, they will disconnect from you because they no longer have a similar emotion. So in other words, you've got to get down to the core the emotion. effect of, of the emotion for that sickness. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. And if you don't get to the causal emotion of that sickness or that illness or whatever is happening to you, what will happen is those spirits will remain attached. In the first century, what, happened, what used to happen a lot is I used to expel spirits from a person, which is quite easy to do, actually. Yeah. But the problem is they'll come back and this is why I said in the Bible there's a comment where I said that, uh, that it leaves the place adorned for seven other spirits worse than the first one to re-enter. Yeah. So that's the danger of expelling a spirit from a person without the person dealing with their emotions, yeah. is that it leaves them totally open to other spirit possession. Yeah. All right? So, so it, the important thing is you understand the soul. The soul contains the emotion. That's the thing you need to work on. Yeah. yeah. Is there any more questions related to that subject? Yeah. And then we'll go on to this soulmate subject. With the God reliance, if, I mean, I'm back to my original, so if I don't know God, I still am processing my own soul. How do I still include this God reliance? All right, um, there's two things, there's two or three things we need to do if we want to have a stronger relationship with God. The first thing is to pray to God for love to enter you. For God's love to enter you. God's love will not enter you unless you long for it. And when I say pray, I'm not saying head. I'm not saying from your head. I'm saying feel a longing. And if you don't have one, generate one. <laughs> right? Well, you know what it's like when you're in a relationship with anybody, don't you? You first meet them, and then you feel some sort of attraction. And then what happens is that you start developing a longing for them, right? And that's what you need to do with God, exactly the same as that. Start having this longing for God. Have a longing for truth as well. No matter what, no matter how painful or how pleasurable it's going to be, you want the truth. 
You want to know it. You want to know the absolute truth, not any bits and pieces of truth. You want the absolute truth from God. That's what you want. Long for that from God. And be totally open to experience your emotions. Now, if you do those three things, what will happen is God's love will start entering you. And as God's starts, love starts entering you, it starts transforming you, and you start understanding things you never understood before. And you understand them here, not here. Right? So, but that is going to mean that you need to be open to the emotional experience. As soon as you close down emotionally, you are closing down your connection with God and you're closing down your connection with truth. Right? So don't do that. Don't close down emotionally. You know, try to stay open emotionally. That's really, really important. But direct your longings to God. And remember that desire doesn't come like from nowhere. Desire needs to be created within you. Right? Do you, do you follow what I mean by that? Like you, there is a spark of desire in you for God's love. But whether you, re whether you do something about it or not is totally up to you. Make the choice to do something about it. Make the choice to actually enter this relationship. Yeah? That's what needs to happen. When you do those three things, God's love will flow. And when God's, love's flo God's love flows into you, you will start understanding other things and you'll feel God, the connection with God. And it, initially, remember in the channeling with Lucinda, it said she said initially she felt it in dribs and drabs and then it just intensified and intensified until she got to a point where it happens constantly. And that's what will happen with you. Right? It'll feel it, you'll feel it in dribs and drabs and dribs and that until you start working through truths, issues of truth and releasing your emotions. And slowly it will get closer and closer and closer until you feel it almost constantly. And then when you feel it constantly, you'll be at one with God. And that's how the relationship grows. Um, yes, you say um, an example of that being um, this week I felt um, I understood the emotions of my grandmothers, like I was feeling and feeling it was like this awareness of emotions that my grandmother had been, but I felt them there yeah. with me revealing those emotions. Yeah. Can that be an example of God's love? Has your grandmother passed? Yeah. Um, there's probably a combination of a couple of things going on. Your grandmother is probably already dealing with her emotions, already dealt with them, but she knows that there's a multi-generational issue within you emotionally that you need to deal with, that she's had, and so she's probably, there's probably this sympathetic attraction with yourself and your grandmother, with your grandmother helping you through this process of, uh, of dealing with that emotion. Yeah. So the key thing for you is to just still allow the emotional experience. Yeah. But all of you have multi-generational injuries. I have multi-generational injuries. Multi-generational injuries are injuries that are passed down from generation to generation that at the time of incarnation infect every new soul that comes onto the earth. So there's very few women on earth that don't have some injuries with men, for example, because generationally there's been lots of abuse between men and women that have just been passed down and passed down. When we finish this topic, can we have a break before we go on to the sure. soulmate topic? Sure. Sure. <laughs> I'm stuck on, uh, okay, we have one incarnation. Have all of those spirits that are connected with us also had one incarnation in the physical? Yes. This will be the only physical that we have? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Reincarnation is possible but not in the way that it's described by any Eastern or, 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 or Buddhist philosophies. Reincarnation is only possible, when I, and I've described it in the DVDs, when you get to the 22nd sphere state, right. then reincarnation is possible. But you won't come back for the purpose of karma. You come back because you love people and you want to help them experience those things you've experienced. So many of you may decide in the future to reincarnate, right? Many of you may decide that you never want to reincarnate again, right? But you will never even get into the state where that's possible until you get to the 22nd sphere condition. So, but we, do we have other lives that are called something other than reincarnating? And um, every spirit who's ever progressed through the spheres treats each sphere as a different life. Okay. So, if I can illustrate that, if you're in the first sphere and you have a heap of mates with you in the first sphere, right? And then all of a sudden, one of your mates grows in love 
and he goes to the second sphere, his body, his material body, that his spirit body looks like it's dissolved. And from all intensive purposes, you will look at the body and think that the body has disappeared. In reality, the body has entered a new state. The spirit body has entered a new state of vibration, which is why we use the term vibration in metaphysics, right? And the spirit body has entered a new state of love, which is, is a new vibrational state. And it's like it disappears from that sphere. And so people in that sphere can no longer see that body. And so they think that the person's returned to earth. But in reality, they've actually progressed up to the next sphere. All right? You follow me? Like, does that, everyone understand what I'm saying there? So, so, so let me draw it. It might not be understandable if I draw it. Here's the spheres of the spirit world. So one, two, three. Remember they are separated by interstellar boundaries, but these yeah. boundaries are boundaries of love, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? So the interstellar boundaries, which are huge gulfs of, time, of light, light, light years in, in distance, are actually boundaries separated by love, different vibrational areas of love. Now if I'm in the first sphere with a group of mates, right? So we've all been there and we've all been there kicking around for 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, sometimes 500, 1,000 years even, right? And one of my mates all of a sudden disappears. Just disappears. What am I going to think? He died. I'm either going to think he died. See, a lot of spirits in the first sphere are still worried about death because they think he might have died, right? They're worried that he might be now back on Earth. Because I believe in reincarnation, so he must have gone back to Earth. Right? So many spirits in the first sphere believe in reincarnation, and they believe the person has gone back to Earth. Right? But in reality, what happened is, because he changed his love condition, he is now in the second sphere. And quite often when I'm talking to spirits, helping them to progress, many of them are ready to progress quite rapidly, and one of the things I try to do is warn them that if they disappear... If, if there's a group of spirits and a heap of them disappear, for the other spirits not to become afraid because they've just gone to a new vibration. What actually happens is if most of the spirits left behind, many of them become even more afraid and then they don't want to do anything that locks them in their fear. So what actually is happening is that they are progressing without needing to come back to Earth and the effect is that this body dissolves or is transformed, if you like, into a new vibrational state. And when it's in this new vibrational state, and this happens with every transition. So if there's 22 of them, it's like having 22 lives, right? Mm -hmm. 22 different existences. It's just, in fact, one existence of the soul, but it, you've changed 22 times. Okay. You follow me? Yeah. And grown 22 times. I've had an experience of time being simultaneous, and it seemed like I saw myself, and it seemed like I was seeing myself at the end of time. Yep. Like I looked different, but I knew myself. Yep. You're, because time, there is no time in the spirit world, when you are in the soul state, when you are in, there are times in your existence even now when you will feel like connect, a connection with yourself so completely and with your spirit body so completely that it will be almost like time stops still. And in those instances, you can actually see in the future. And this is how mm -hmm. spirits see in the future and come to tell you about it. They can see in the future what is going to happen based on your decisions that you're making now. Which may change, of course. Remember, with, con with quantum the physics theories, the process of observation changes <coughs> the actual occurrence, right? Mm -hmm. so, so every time you observe something, it's going to be different the next instant you observe it depending on the choices you've made in between. Yeah. But does everyone understand what's going on there? Can you see why even the spirits believe in past lives? Because they actually, many spirits, it's only when they get up to the fourth or fifth spheres they say, oh, I, I can see what's going on now. You know, I'm progressing and, I dis and I, you know, my mates progress and they disappear and then they come back and visit me and I can see them. But it's only once that starts happening regularly that you start realising that that's going on. Right. Yeah. But if time is simultaneous, it would appear from your point of view that it's past and future, but it, it felt like it was all happening I immediately. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> is there a question in that? Yeah. I but wanna, that, that's I a true statement. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Before you rub off the word locks, yeah. um, you said that 
Can, can yeah. I, can yes. I finish that? Has everyone, is everyone okay with that? No, no. no. no okay, tell me. The, the first person then moves on to the second sphere. Then. Yep. If, why do they disappear without speaking to the, to the other person? Because they get so engrossed in their life and how much better it is. That would help if they... Yeah, but a lot of times they don't mm -hmm. think of going no. back. No. How many times have you moved from one place to another place on earth, mm -hmm. had a better life and never gone back to the original place that you went from. And this is exactly how they feel. Like you don't want to go back because of some emotions that were connected with that first place generally, right? And so so you know, you imagine if you'd lived here for a hundred years in the hills and then you slowly progressed up and then you made this transition. A lot of your memories still here, emotional memories of this location would be quite negative, would they not? And, and you'd lived a hundred years of our time there, right? So it, it would feel like, oh, horrible, right? So would you want to go back at that moment? Now, a lot of times they might progress a bit further and then they realise, yeah, I do want to go back and tell them. But in that time, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of our time on Earth may have, may have happened. You follow me? So for many of them, they don't go back until they start getting on the divine path, because this is natural love path. It's not that I want to go back, it's that I want to tell them I'm leaving. Uh, they, a lot of times you don't even know you're leaving. A lot of, and a lot of times you've grown in love to a certain degree, but you don't know you have until the transition has been made. You follow me? Well, this is why I'm teaching what I'm teaching is so that people learn all this on earth and then right. nobody will have a problem with it, right? But the truth is that this is what happens because there's so much ignorance. That there's so much ignorance in the first sphere. You know when you go to a seance or you go to a, you know, a medium or anything like that to talk to spirits, most of the time you know who you're talking to. You're talking to first sphere spirits, right? Because they're the ones the medium can connect to because she's, she's not dealt with her emotions either, right? And so what's happening is a lot of the information you're getting is true information as it relates to the first sphere. But it's not the truth of the universe. It's only the truth is as it relates to the first sphere. You follow me? So you might think you have a desire to go back, but many don't. And who will you go back to? Will you go back to everyone? There's billions of people there. Will you do that? See, most people don't. What they do is they go back to their friends, talk about it with their friends, and that's, then they go on. No, I want to do everything before I leave. I want to tell them exactly where I'm going. But if you don't know you're making the transition, how do you know that you can do that? You don't even know you're making your own transition. Well, the transition is automatic as soon as you enter a new state of love. And you don't know that that is. See, many people, if they knew, they wouldn't be going through these terrible experiences. They'd already be up here, right? The majority of them would already be very progressed if they knew. The problem is in the first sphere, the majority of people are in ignorance. And so they don't know. And so they don't even know that when they make a transition in love, that they're actually going to go into a new location. And they don't even understand that. So they don't know in advance. Until somebody tells them. Someone there pushing you up. Someone pushing you up. <laughs> you can't be pushed up. It's all to do with love. I think that um, if I'm moving, uh, there's, there's somebody there helping me to move. Uh, there'll be a guide helping you, but a lot of times, even if, if you're in a first fear state, a lot of times you will not trust anybody. Because you, you think of it, how many of you have feelings of or emotions inside of you right now where you don't trust what you're hearing from me right now? You see, that's a prevalent emotion, is it not? Mistrust, mm. right? And when you when you pass over in the first fear, most spirits who are in the first fear don't have a, have any trust. Um, is it still about this subject? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, this lady down here is going to do hands. Is it about this subject? Yes, it is. Then tell me, please. <laughs> it's about we're talking about the, the, the evolution of love, natural love into divine love. Mm -hmm. That's what the question's all about. And maybe I missed something on the two DVDs. Yeah. But I can't quite um, figure out how, given who you are, who you say you are, mm -hmm. you are grappling still with issues of self-love. Mm -hmm. All right. How many have an issue with that? Everyone? Can you repeat the yeah. question again, please? How many of you expect Jesus to be perfect? 
Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't expect that. No, I know. I've experienced God, Jesus, and I have experienced him. Yeah. I'm, it's always been of a, of a being with extraordinary capacity to love. Yeah. So, and I have an, an idea that if one has a capacity to love, to give love, that first one has to love oneself. True. That's, that's where I come from in that question, so this is where True. I'm a bit confused sure. to have that. Here's all the spheres, and there was spheres up to 20 seconds here. Huh? All through that life, I never had any emotional damage at all. all right? So I have the amount of divine love in my soul that enables me to be, live in that location. But as soon as I reincarnated, and this applies to my soulmate as well when she reincarnated, and remember that it has been prophesied in the Bible and other places that I was going to do this, that I was going to return, right? What happens is the emotional damage from my parents starts in straight away filtering into my soul. And the memories that I have of all of that life, that 2,000 years in my case of life, start triggering all of these new emotions that I now need to deal with. You follow me? Now, I could have chosen to re-enter the earth without reincarnation. Because when you're in the 22nd sphere state, you can create a body at will. So you can without actually... Without coming through a birth canal, are you saying? Yep. Through, 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 a thing, through a female body? Yeah. Really? Yeah, you can materialise a, a form. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, any spirit above the 7th sphere can do that. And any, even spirits below. Who's heard of Anastasia? Yeah. Who's read some of the... She's a 5th sphere spirit at the time of the writing who materialised a form, right? So, so you can materialise a form, right, on Earth. And so, but I chose to not do that because what that would do was actually worsen people's beliefs about myself. You follow me? I hear what you're saying, but I'm not sure that I agree with your reasoning. I know you don't agree with my reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I don't is I have a very close personal friend who has actually incarnated twice not through the birth canal, and I actually know that this is the case. Right. And she doesn't have these kinds of issues. She chose, uh, you know. Yeah, but you're saying that I, I need to make the same choices that she's no, made. I'm not saying that you need to make the same choices, Aren't but you? I'm just. Mm -hmm. um, you, your reason for saying that you came through was that you felt you wouldn't be believed. No, not at all. Or that people wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to have the same impact on people. Certainly. Definitely would not be able to have the same impact. So what, what, do, what do I want to teach you? I don't want to teach you that I'm different to you. I want to teach you that I'm exactly the same as you. Yes. I want to teach you that, that you know, the only reason, the only difference is be open and willing to experience all of your own emotions and pray for love. Yeah. And yeah. the other things I want to teach, how am I going to teach you that if I don't live it? Because well, I didn't live it in the first century. Okay. I mean, it's not a teaching that I haven't heard before. I've, I've also been to the Oneness University. They teach it there. Mm -hmm. This other being that I'm telling you about teaches the same thing and lives it. Mm -hmm. um, I've lived with her. Mm -hmm. She certainly experiences emotions, but she's, it's how she experiences them that, that I learn from that is different. Mm -hmm. And she also is, is love, totally love. Mm -hmm. And certainly I, I, I see her teaching those things very effectively and lovingly with people. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you do too. I'm not, I'm not wanting you to think that I am criticising or implying your criticism, mm -hmm. but I felt that I needed to have some sort of understanding of that because... Yeah, but, but see, I don't need you to believe who I am. Of course you don't. And, and in the end it will become clear whether I am who I'm saying I am or not. Yeah. All right? And all, all I'm doing is telling you right now what my experience has been, that's all. And I know for certain that there has never been another re reincarnation since so I was if, reincarnated. If you, if from, you from before I was reincarnated. If you need to re-experience all of these things again in order to... I didn't to have, need to. Well, if you chose to do that in order for us to be able to, to believe you? No. Or to recognise... No, no, to no. <laughs> it's so, so that I can demonstrate my love for you and so that I can demonstrate what you also need to do if you want to become a one with God. I can, dem I can physically demonstrate it. Do you have to be Jesus, though, in particular? Like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> just be, just, no, just 14. Just AJ and just be AJ. But, uh, and do no, the same thing, I, I am. Do the same thing because cut the Jesus factor out of it and you could be that. But I am who I am. But, and if I am going to remain in harmony with my relationship with God, I need to ad admit not only to myself but also to you who I am. Do you know that it's necessary for it to, to, be, to say that really even? Because we probably could have been uh, Melchizedek or Joseph or whoever else who wanted to be. No, it's not about who I wanted to be. <laughs> I certainly don't want to be Jesus. <laughs> At the moment, I certainly don't want to be. <laughs> It's just who I am. Like, one of the very first emotions I've had to deal with is, is uh-oh, <laughs> and I'm going to have to say that I'm Jesus. And uh, that, that, took me, that took me eight months of emotional processing to actually come to terms with being able to do that. Because, because I knew that all of you would have these reactions. Right? These reactions of, oh, but you don't have to say you're Jesus to, for, for to teach these things. But AJ, yeah. I could probably happily sit and listen to you talk and teach the way you're teaching mm -hmm. very comfortably, very openly. So why are you not Whether comfortable? Or not, you told me you were Jesus. But, but you're not comfortable with me telling you you're Jesus. Well, the truth is you're not comfortable. Right now the emotion inside of you is you are not comfortable with me saying it. Same goes with yourself. Well, that's probably true. How many of you don't feel comfortable with me saying it? And it's not anything. It's okay. The reason for me is that there's a lack of confidence in, my, in the way I believe it, and you're explaining that to me now, which is why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. With Jesus, as I understand him to be. But this is this is part life, of the problem, is it? Someone who isn't able to love themselves and track them. Yeah, I know. So this is part of the problem, is that you all have misconceptions of me. All of you. All of you have misconceptions of the truth as well. You all think that somehow. Like, you, you don't understand this soul damage thing that goes on at reincarnation, for example. Here, you don't feel it here in your heart. You don't realise the truth of it yet. That's okay. I'm just saying, this is what's actually happened. You don't have to believe any of it, but you will come to believe it, I can assure you, down the track. Now, I know that might sound arrogant, but I'm not being arrogant, what I'm just saying. You see, this is something I've actually had described to me before. I'm not having an issue with that. You've had described people entering from the 22nd sphere into a split soul union state to come well, down to earth. You've never had that said to you maybe before. Maybe not exactly, but it meant much of what you teach. Maybe not this, this structure mm -hmm. in the same sense, but yeah. in other words. Of course, a lot of truth. You talk of spheres, the Indians talk of locus. Of course. You talk of, much of it is the same. Of course. It's a different language. I have heard, heard it. So what, of course that's going to be so the I case, isn't it? I have an issue it? with it. I absolutely don't have an issue with what you teach. But you do have an issue with me. No. Emotionally, yes, you do. No, I just had a question. <laughs> <laughs> a question which you answered. See, I think you get quite defensive because you want people to be to reject the idea. Do you feel I'm being defensive? No. no. Who's being defensive? Who do you feel is being defensive? See, see, see how do you know my emotions if you're the one experiencing the emotion? See, I don't I, feel defensive. I, I think I asked a question that's... A number of other people wanted answered as well yes. about how Jesus could grapple with issues of life. And I've, an and I've answered it. Yes. But yes. not to your satisfaction. No, that's fine because the question, then what came up over there was something quite different. Yeah, but, but the point saying. is that the answer isn't to your satisfaction. Emotionally, um, the answer isn't to your satisfaction. And there's a reason inside of you why that answer is not to your satisfaction. And that's because of some expectations you have of Jesus. And what you believe Jesus to be, yeah, the, and it's not who the I am. Question came from my belief that Jesus was someone who was was I've experienced what I believed had been a, a physical mm -hmm. connection with Jesus in mm -hmm. a very powerful way, and it was overwhelmingly full of love. Mm -hmm. And and I see you as a loving person too. But my question, and I guess it came from the intellect, was was how then are you still grappling with with self love? Mm -hmm. As I said, you've explained that. But not to your emotional satisfaction. Well, you know, maybe I just need a little bit more time to... to um, yeah, don't, to don't feel... That. Don't, don't worry about what I'm saying. I'm just saying I know that it's not to your emotional <laughs> satisfaction. 
right? So, so while I've said all of this to you, it doesn't mean you're going to believe it until you experience it. And this is the case with everything I'm saying to you. All of this at the moment is just intellectual thoughts entering you through your ears, interpreted through your emotional state, whatever that state is, and entering your heart, right? This is all, everything I'm saying to you is like this. Every single thing you're hearing from me is a thought being transmitted through your ear, translated from language into feelings through your emotional filter, whatever your emotional filter is. Now, many of you have had a personal experience with Jesus, em emotionally. And yes, I am capable of doing that. It's just you don't understand that at the moment. Right? You don't even know that you're capable of doing that. <laughs> Right? You're capable of interacting with other people emotionally without being present. You are capable of that totally. You don't know that, many of you, yet. Right? Some of you maybe understand that, but you don't know it. But those things are all possible and will continue to be possible. That, that doesn't change the, the fact that the person standing right in front of you is who is saying he is. Right? Even though you may not believe it. Yep. And then the descent into the physical realm. Yep. Does that tank the quality of the love? Certainly, it's a very traumatic or experience. Does it, does it just confuse the because because what it's I'm a bit confused about you know the soul and its quality yep. versus what it might be carrying with it or is it the same thing? The, all of your love can only be reflected through your emotions. That's how you transmit love to others, through your emotions. So if you have some emotional damages in there as well, it doesn't matter how deep the quality of your love is, it will be passed through those emotional filters right, to the other person. So what the other person will be feel is the original love and some emotional filters, and that's what they receive. So then, of course, there's also their own emotional filters so before they receive the quality of your soul now. No, the quality of the soul can be at a certain level, but you still not feel it for lots of different no, I reasons. I understand that you can, you can, it can be blocked or... Yeah. So you can't lose divine love once you've received it. So do we all get born with pure divine love? No. You get born with no divine love. Okay. So and this is a very important thing to understand, and I felt that from a lot of you. <laughs> Many of you didn't agree with that statement. <laughs> right? And the truth is that none of you are born with divine love. Because to do that, God would have had to break the laws of free will. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. If God gave you divine love without you feeling for it in your soul, he would have had to force you to receive divine love against your will. But that happened to you in the first century, didn't it? No. No, I never received any divine love against my will, ever. But you were born in divine... No. I thought you said you were, you never felt anything. No, I was born, and then some spirits cleared away the emotional damage that I received from my parents, and then I was in a pristine, natural love state, but I still needed to ask for divine love. I did not have divine love at that point. Is that... you follow that? Yeah, very important to understand that. I would imagine the concept of Adam and Eve having the first... Um, Self-reliance yep. afterwards. Yep. So the state they were in at the beginning, would that be classed as having divine love? No. Mm -hmm. They were in a perfect natural love state. Wow. Totally and, different. Thing. Yeah, when you talk with Ammon and a man, which you can do, all of you are possible, mm -hmm. you know, all of you are potential mediums, so all of you at some point can actually talk to them. You will realise they'll tell you that they were not in a, they were not in a at one condition with God. And they had to actually ask for divine love and that was offered to them and they rejected it. What they actually decided was that they could be gods without God. That was the decision they made at the time. And it was a, a, a decision of self-reliance. And that decision of self-reliance alienated them from God. That emotion alienated them from God. Yeah. Were they materialised, were they? Sorry? Were they materialised? 
No, no, they, God, God actually created them, physically created them. So they didn't have, like, they weren't born, they were physically created. And their soul was implanted into their body. They don't know how long their body existed before their soul entered it. Do you follow me? So before them, they were like animal, and like an animal, if you like. They had a spirit form and a material form, but there was no soul attached. And they just woke up one day, and this is how they'll describe it to you, they woke up one day as an adult in a form, and that was their first consciousness of existence. So you're actually saying that animals don't have souls? No, animals have a spirit body, but not a soul. Animals reflect your soul condition. Yeah, be careful with all scientific proof because all scientific proof is, particularly carbon dating proof. Carbon dating proof is all based around the constancy of carbon in the atmosphere, and constant and and there is not constant carbon at, in the atmosphere, as you know. Look, look, the reason why we've got global warming is because of huge amounts of carbon now released into the atmosphere that's never been there historically. So what what all of these dating, all these dating methods rely on constancy on the Earth environment. And the Earth environment has not been constant. So how many thousand years would you say? So you're saying about 6,000 years? No, no, 100,000 years or so ago. For instance, Adam and Eve? Yeah, Eve's. yeah. So why is it in the Bible? It's, it's, they're not saying that, are they? No, because what happened in the Bible was that uh, the Bible was constructed by the Israelites in an effort to formulate, and the book of Genesis, for example, where all of this information is contained, was formulated by a conglomeration of all the information that was available ver verbally. And what Moses did, in particular, was he penned it all down. And Moses was also a medium, and so he penned down a lot of information from spirits, all different kinds of information from different levels of spirits. That became the Talmud, or the first five books of the Bible. But in particular, the book of Genesis is based around all of these combinations of writings. And so there is some truths in them, in the sense of philosophical truths, but there's also quite a lot of errors in them too as to what, what happened because they're just a combination of man's writings before then and verbally. They passed down things mostly by, by word, so there's lots of distortions. So timing's out. Your timing is correct, though. You're saying 2,008 years. Your timing is correct since you were on Earth last. Yeah, I, I was 36 when I died. Uh, well, I was in my 36th year. I was, in terms of our language today, I was 35 years old when I died in the first century. Um, in the Israelites' term, terminology back then, I would have been classified as 36 in my 36th year. Um, and that, that happened around 29 CE. And then once I passed, I've lived the rest of my life in the spirit world until 1962. You didn't did resurrect? Um, there's no, when they say resurrection, whenever I've talked about in the first century resurrection, I was talking about the resurrection of the soul. I was talking about the new birth. But in terms of resurrection, in terms of me being resurrected, you know, the truth is that the instant you pass, you will have a disconnection of the cord that connects you from your physical body and you will be a spirit being. Right? And that's exactly what happened to me. All I did was I then materialised a, a physical form to demonstrate to people that I was still alive. Yeah. That's the only difference. Yeah. And you are totally capable of doing exactly the same thing, by the way. But I wanted to do that to illustrate to people that there was life after you died. Yeah. Nobody believed that, really. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened to your body then? I dematerialised my body. Yeah. So, so, that, so that people could see that the person that was standing in front of them wasn't still the slab body lying on the slab. Right? If, I dematerial, if I left the body there, then there'd be some confusion. So, so I dematerialised. Is that why like, you materialised your body? Is that why you said for no one to touch you? Um, I didn't say for no one to touch me. That's a misconception in the Bible. Um, plenty of people touch me. Thomas uh, even put his hands through, my, his fingers through my wrists. Um, Mary, I gave Mary hugs on a number of occasions, my soulmate. So, no, people certainly touched me. Um, yeah. where, where that, can I say why they have written that in the Bible? They've written that in the Bible to try and make out that I was some now holy creature. 
something different than all of you. The truth is that I'm not. So, you know, a lot of the things that were written in the Bible about that experience have been written to, uh, what would you say, to, to, to sort of blow up my importance, if you like. Uh, to make me comparable to Buddha and other people who had these legends about them, which were also, by the way, not true. Um, because, it, you know, a lot of times, historically, what would happen is that there'd be a person coming along generating some enlightenment on the earth, and then people would glorify them and make them into a god. They're still doing it. And they're still doing that, right? Yeah. Now, now, that's the opposite of what I wanted. And, in fact, you know, my, my, my last prayer to my father was, that they become at one with me just as I am at one with God. Like, so I don't want separation. I don't want people to be separate from me and think that I'm something up there. And I'm not, you know. I'm just the same as you. We That's all I am. We would humanity be, though. Like, because humanity loves Jesus and we follow Jesus. Why would we not want to be as a humanity if we hadn't have put you on this pedestal? Right? Um, I feel in a better condition. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Honest, honestly, um, for two thousand years, I've had to put up with the projections of people thinking that I'm that, that I'm better than them, and and that's not the case at all. Did you actually feel that? Too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I certainly feel that. Like it, it's. It, it, well, it, you know, every single every single year when Christmas was celebrated, I would wouldn't be present. You know. Because it's just like the whole, the whole, um, the whole emotion involved in it of worship of of, of a person uh, thinking that they're better than you are is just just so totally wrong to me, and uh, and totally against my feelings inside of myself. And so you know, for me, that's a very big issue, and and it's still an issue that I'm struggling with in terms of um, even just saying who I am, because a, a lot of a lot of times, as soon as I say who I am, people then assume that I'm setting myself above them. And it's totally the opposite of what I want to achieve. Um, well, I guess we think of you as, as, according to the story that we've been brought up with, which is what naturally what I did, mm -hmm. what most people would do. I have an idea of who Jesus was. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm very grateful that you just, we just had this discussion because it's actually put things into a different perspective for me, which makes me feel much more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Quite honestly, you know. Yeah, see, the way I, the way I feel is quite... Um, I've, I've had a lot of emotions to process about the glorification of myself. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm working through some very deep unworthiness issues. Mm -hmm. It's because I just feel that it's so unwarranted. Well, then, um, of course, we project this story onto you. Yeah. Everyone that you've told now that you're Jesus... We all are instantly projecting our story. Yeah. That's what we do. That's yeah. what we can do. That's yeah. all we know. Yeah. Now you've given me another idea of, of what you... And want. this has happened to me and all my life, uh, even in the spirit world, where I, you know, people would ask for Jesus to come to them. And, of course, I'm a spirit, so I can easily come to them. So, yeah. so I just go to them, and then they'd say, who are you? And I'd say, well... Yeah. And and this is a, a problem for me is that one of the reasons why I felt the need to come back in the way that I have too is 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 to, to deconstruct all of these stories. Yeah. Um, and to help all of you understand that, that what I have done in my own life, you can all do. And it's just a matter of... And, and I haven't done what I've done in my own life because of anything inside of me aside from a desire to connect with God. Right? So it's my burning desire to connect with God and to live in truth. And that's, that's my burning desire. And so that's... You know, all you need to do is have the same desire. You follow me? Yeah. And, and you can achieve exactly the same thing. You can change the world and, and the universe mm -hmm. with those desires. Yeah. Exactly. God created you the same as me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to be honest with you, I'm very tired of all of these projections that I'm somehow greater than you mm -hmm. in my capacity, because I am not. With, when you're opening to divine love, is it instant? Because if it's not, it could become this 
longing that never gets fulfilled. You know, it becomes this big drama. Oh, show yourself. So the instant you have a pure desire for God's love is the instant you will receive it. If you're not receiving it and you're not conscious of it being received, it's because there's, there's an emotional block in you that is, not, that is making your desire impure. Oh God, God always responds to your longing. Do you understand? Like God, God is not a parent. In the first century, it said God is not a parent. When you ask him for a loaf of bread, he gives you a serpent. God's not like that. God doesn't give you the opposite of what you ask for. He gives you exactly what you ask for. But it's what you ask for here in your heart, not, not what you think you're asking for. Right? He gives you what you're really asking for in your heart. And it's what your pure desire is in your heart that matters. That's the key thing, what's going on inside of your heart. You follow me? Yeah. So let yourself have a longing for God inside of your heart. And let yourself see all of the impurities that stop you from doing that and feel those emotions. Yeah. Let yourself do that. Um, with all due respect, um, were you crucified in the first, semester, uh, first uh, century? First century. And, well, not in the manner described, but I was, I was hung on a stake. Yes. So, in my opinion, somebody who was crucified would be somebody who was in victim mode. And I don't really think that the Jesus Christ that I know, uh, or any being who would be of that vibration, divine love vibration, would be in victim mode and therefore crucified. So, could you please explain that? How did I get crucified with my law of attraction, is really the question you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I chose <laughs> to be um, crucified, um, and I know this is going to sound probably a li little weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, okay. well, like else you've said, Not you? like it. <laughs> Fair enough. Touche. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. What happened was that uh, after three and a half years of ministry, I started realizing that very few people were actually doing their emotional work. Very few people had a deep longing for God and a deep longing for God's love. And the reason why was because they didn't trust that it was true. They didn't trust that they had, a, they didn't believe they had anything other than this life, the life that they had in the physical state. Even my own soulmate did not believe uh, in, at the soul level, she, it, it, it appealed to her, and just like it appeals to you, right? It appeals to all the people when you start talking about having an eternal existence, and this, this is only a part of it. It appeals to everyone because it means that we don't have to afraid, be afraid of death and for lots of other reasons emotionally as well. But it never hit their heart. And so what happened was that very few people, after three and a half years of talking and, and explaining the truths about divine love and how it enters the soul and all those kind of things, very few people were, were listening. And there was also a lot of opposition. And when I say a lot of opposition, uh, what, what would happen is because of the religious format at the time was one of priesthood laity, what would happen is the priesthood started feeling that they were going to lose their control over the masses, if the masses continued to listen to the message that I was speaking as much as I was speaking. And so what happened was that uh, they then started uh, sending assassins to try to kill me, uh, and it, I had a few attempts on my life before I died. And, and then what happened was that um, um, because I realised that really in the end the only way people were going to believe that there was life after death, if I could term it, use that terminology, um, was for me to actually demonstrate that there was life after death. You follow me? Yeah. And so, and so what I did was, um, up until that time, up until I had that realisation, I kept avoiding and avoiding and avoiding this circumstance and avoiding that circumstance and avoiding this circumstance. I'd, so basically I'd run away from uh, potential harm because I had many spirits communicating with me, telling me that, oh, tomorrow this is going to happen if you stay here. And so what I would do straight away is that night I'd get up and leave and go somewhere else. And I did that a lot of times throughout the three and a half years that I went in the public preaching work. 
So what, what would happen was that uh, I'd get these uh, indications that there were going to be problems the next day or something, and in the majority of instances what I would do is I'd leave that town and go to another town and begin preaching there or begin teaching there. And of course oh, by that must have bummed them out. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of times what happened is that the, there were a group of people with me following me as well. Uh, when I say following me, they were just my mates, just like you have mates and friends, and we all just got up and left, right? And we'd go to another place. And there were men, more women than men, in fact, uh, were doing that. So there were more women follow, more women who would follow with us than men. And, and we'd go to another location and then we'd stay in that location and then the minister, you know, priesthood would find this and then, and then the same kind of event would occur again where I'd leave that location to get away from the potential danger and go to another location. So it got that way after three and a half years of going from one location to another location to another location and the attempts on my life intensifying and, and in the end everybody becoming more and more afraid about that. And so, and so what, I, what I felt was that at some point I was going to die uh, because at some point there were going to be too many attempts for me to get away from. And I also felt that at some point I would have to die to demonstrate the truth that there was in fact everlasting life. There was in fact life after a person died. We have a spirit body. I wanted to demonstrate that. So about... Uh, Two weeks before the crucifixion, my soulmate had some, mem some, some visions about my coming death, which she didn't tell me about. And, um, and then the night, of, uh, the night that I was captured by the Roman soldiers, um, John the Baptist, who was dead, uh, appeared to me and told me that if I remained where I was that night, that I would be captured within a few hours. And, uh, and it would lead to my death. So um, I had to make a decision, really. And the re uh, have any of you read the Bible? Yeah. In John 17, John chapter 17, is a record of my prayer to my father about that coming, that coming uh, event. So, um, so what I had to do then was just make the decision, was I going to decide to leave that situation again or was I going to just follow through now and just let the events occur? And so what I decided at that point was that I would let the events occur. And that's one of the reasons why my soulmate's quite angry with me now because she feels that I shouldn't have let those events occur. It had a terrible impact on her life after that. So, um, so the events of that night and the following day were all the result, really, of my choice to, to no longer get away from that situation. And the reason why that situation occurred regularly was because of... Um, I describe it in the pageant messages as a war between truth and error. <coughs> when you are in a condition of truth, you do not compromise the condition. <laughs> Do you follow? When you, when you get into a condition of truth where you love truth more than life, you will never ever compromise the truth for anything, ever. Right? Once you get into that condition, that will automatically attract every single person around you who's in error. Because every person in error needs truth in order to grow. Do you follow me? So the law of attraction is all this truth is going to attract a lot of error as well. Right? And, and the error is attracted in order for the error to be exposed and worked on emotionally, if the person has that choice, if they're going to make that choice. But actually what happened, the majority of times what ha actually happened was that error usually wants to fight for error. And that's what happened in, in my case. So error fought for error and I wouldn't budge. I had the opportunity to get out of it many times over the next day. Uh, where I could have said, no, I'm not the Messiah, or I could have said, no, I'm not the King of the Jews, and I could have said, there's a lot of things that I could have said that may have delayed the event, which I chose not to say. Does that make sense? And that's why it all happened. To demonstrate life after death. To demonstrate the people they had nothing to fear. Did you actually say, Father will have you forsaken me? No. 
No, the question that was asked then was, did I actually say, my father, why have you forsaken me? And I never said that. So you did actually, you did die for our sins of no. error, is that? No. No. But you, you died to show us that um, we... I, I, I lived a life of truth to show you the results of truth. Yeah, that we can too. That you can do as well. But I didn't die for your sins. No, in fact, nobody can die for your sins. Even you can't. <laughs> yeah. do, do you understand? Yeah. You will not die for your sins. You will pay for your sins. <laughs> you won't die. You won't die for them. But you were saying you thought that too many people were in error, that they were, they weren't, um, they weren't getting what you were trying to teach them. Well, what happened was that emotionally they couldn't get it because emotionally they didn't have the confidence to experience their emotions because they didn't believe there was any point to it. It's a bit like, like why, f why listen to what AJ is saying if, there's, if it's hopeless? Mm. Yeah. <coughs> there's no point, is there, really? If there's no hope, then why do it? And many of you feel hopeless in your life, don't you, at times? But why am I doing this? This just feels hopeless, right? Hopelessness is a major emotion here on earth, a major emotion that prevents spiritual growth. And many of my friends in the first century had that feeling of hopelessness in their heart, where, where no matter what I said, they, were, they, they felt the, appealing of, the, appeal, you know, the appeal of what I said. They could see the healings occurring and they could see the different events that occurred that there was proof to it. But it all still felt hopeless for them because they still felt this huge fear of death. And, and there was no way to illustrate the truth of that without actually dying and coming back and demonstrating it. And so after I passed, instant, instantly afterwards, I could return. And after talking to a heap of people in, this, in the hells of the spirit world, I returned a few days later and actually began talking to people on earth. And I did that for nearly 50 days. Um, so for nearly 50 days, I materialised a body every day and talk to people. I talked to nearly 500 people in that time uh, where, that I personally appe appealed to, uh, appeared before. And the reason why the Christian movement grew so rapidly was because I reappeared to them and talked to them. Um, and all of the truths that I'd taught them over the previous three and a half years, um, you know, they then believed. And they then started to do the soul work. They then started to do the soul work so much that by 50 days later, at Pentecost, 120 or so of them actually received divine love. And many of them hadn't received much divine love up until that point. Yeah. So that's how it grew. I've just got a general question about when we pass over. Yep. Which bit we're going to go to? Where your current soul development okay. allows you to go to. So if you develop your soul here on earth to the point of, the, of at one moment with God, you will pass into the eighth sphere. If you develop your soul um, not at all, you will pass in the first sphere. So it all just depends on what you, how you develop your soul in love as to where you will pass into. Is there anyone living now who's on the eighth sphere? No. On earth, no. Yeah, no. no. There's no one on earth in the eighth sphere. Seven? No. <laughs> So aside from people on the divine love path, there are quite a number of people on the divine love path in the fifth sphere, and, and there's a few in the seventh. But Can you so name sorry. Can you name some? Can I? <laughs> I prefer not to. Um, the Eckhart Tolle. Sorry. Eckhart Tolle. Um, Eckhart Tolle um, is actually in the fourth sphere, on the on the divine love path, because he's actually received the divine love but he doesn't understand how to replicate the reception. And sooner or later I'll meet him, I'm sure. So. He's actually coming, to, um, he's doing a retreat probably next year. Oh, okay, yeah. He's, he's still very, very natural love oriented, uh, even though he has received some divine love. And this happens often on earth, uh, where people receive some divine love, but they're still very intellectually oriented because they feel that that's the way they've grown. Um, so he, he will probably, not be able to grow much more than that unless he, re unless he understands divine love. Can you talk more about divine love? I will in another session, yeah. Oh. Um, I believe that you, and most spirits, when you pass over, go to the first sphere. Um, and I understand that um, people like uh, Nero and Hitler created sort of were in the first sphere. So what I was asking is that if we, if my understanding of what Nero represented and his atrocities, 
with Petra. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, most of us, or most of the spirits that have passed, will go through the first sphere. So, when I think of people who might not... Can we clarify that a bit, though? Because it's, it's important that we clarify that there are actually thousands of planes in the first sphere. That's what I want to know. How can um, I... You know the, the movie, What Dreams May Come? Every single depiction in what dreams may come is actually a depiction of something in the first sphere. So, he, you know his beautiful location that he lived in? That was actually in the first sphere in a place called Summerland. That's what that looks like. And that's the top of the first sphere. And the bottom of the first sphere is the hills. And remember when he went to visit his wife? That was sort of like, that was nowhere near the bottom of the first sphere. That was like sort of halfway <coughs> down, if you like. Right? And it gets progressively worse and worse and worse and worse the further down you go in the first sphere. So the first sphere has huge gradients of different levels of love in it. Right? And then the second sphere is in a totally different condition again. So you know the picture you have of him, at the, the last picture of him with his wife, when he's with his wife and his daughter comes up, and they're in that beautiful location that they've created. Um, you know, that's just before getting into the second sphere. Oh, God, it's the 22nd one, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, how is that? It's up there. <laughs> I was talking to Grant this morning about that. And we need to have a break. But I was talking to Grant this morning about that, and, and it, it's, it's totally unimaginable, and there's nothing I could say to describe it. Is that because it has no content? Uh, no, it, it has, it's full of content. It's full of content, but not, not the kind of content that is anything that's even in your imagination. So, we hopefully will demonstrate some of that anyway. Grant? Grant? Maybe we should have a break. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Everyone can relieve their bladders. <laughs> No, we're clapping because you've left. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's fed, or, well, probably watered and unwatered, should say. <laughs> I'm in a good state for that. I, I just had a five minute conversation with my soulmate. So just... Sorry? Um, can I ask something different then? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, I will talk a little about soulmates. I promised I would, so I will. Can you get the addresses and phone numbers of ours? No. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know the address or phone number of mine. <laughs> um, as to what happened before the incarnation of the first human couple, nobody actually knows. <coughs> All we can do is suppose or investigate through scientific methods what actually occurred before then. Because the first conscious existence was when the first human couple incarnated into the forms that God had already created. So it was impossible, it was impossible for anybody to really accurately tell you what the truth is about what happened before then. And uh, because no one has personally experienced it, because no one was conscious at the time. So uh, it's impossible for me to ask, answer that question as well. All we can do is investigate it. And the high likelihood, yes, is that the human form in the physical state may have uh, you know, been like animals in a way, in the sense that they just lived and died, lived and died, lived and died, and generated to such a point that God actually incarnated the human soul into it. My feelings are totally different to that. I feel that God created the human form at that instant. Um, and uh, but in terms of in terms of proving that, of course, I can't prove that. So we weren't colonized. Sorry. Earth wasn't colonized. No. So why are humans not animals? Um, what makes you human is not your physical form. Soul. It's your soul. 
it's not even your spirit body that makes you human, it's actually your soul. So, so the human soul is a unique creation of God. And that is the part of you that I wish you to focus on. Because that is the real you. There will be a time in your life when you don't have a physical form and you don't even have a spirit body form. And in fact, there will be a time in your life when you will be able to create hundreds of thousands of bodies that you connect with that express yourself to other people if you wish. Not just one body. Do you follow me? It's like, you, in your existence, in the 22nd sphere location, you can create hundreds of thousands of, of physical forms through which you express yourself. Right? If you want to do that. Many times you choose not to because there's more powerful ways of expressing yourself. But sometimes a physical form is a, 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 an appropriate way to express yourself to someone here on earth when you're in that state. So the key, the key for you to realise is that as you grow, there is just this huge, this huge creations and, and worlds of opportunity open to you that are vastly beyond your own imagination at the moment as to what you could even conceive is possible. And the key, the key to all of that growth is to seek first the kingdom, to, to seek first God's love. Get to that state first because then you will start to understand what's available to you in all other ways. And the way my focus of my, you know, my feelings and my focus is always upon God. And the reason why is that's been the longing of my soul. And what I, what I feel is that firstly God bestowed his love and gave mankind the opportunity to receive his love to get above the natural love state and into the new, the divine state, if you like. God gave mankind that, that amount of love as a possibility to enter their soul and transform their soul. But there are other qualities of God that I believe God is also going to make available to man once man gets into that 20-second sphere state. And so I believe there's going to be other qualities of God that God's going to bestow upon man that we'll actually experience from God. So rather than imagining it or thinking it, we will be able to actually begin to absorb that quality of God just like now we have the, quali we have the ability to absorb God's love and transform the soul. So that's my focus, but that is not the focus of all spirits in the spirit world. And, and certainly not the focus of even spirits in the celestial kingdom, which is above the, the eighth sphere. Every single one of you has a unique thing, qualities in your soul. Unique qualities that no other soul ever, ever created or ever who has experienced life has ever had. So every single one of you, as you grow, changes the universe. Do you, do you understand that? As you grow from one location to another location, in the spirit world or even here on earth in terms of love, your entire your growth changes even the physical location. So for example, when I entered the seventh sphere, I was the before the seventh sphere existed, there was only the six spheres, one to six. Then when I got into a condition in the first century where I entered into the seventh sphere, right, what actually happened is that I was the first person to enter the seventh sphere and the seventh sphere created got created because the first person entering it creates the sphere, creates the dimension. Mm -hmm. And then, after that sphere was created, what happened is my personality was reflected in it. Do you follow me? Yeah. And then the next person who entered the seventh sphere location, which was a spirit in the spirit world, when he entered the location, his personality reflected and automatically changed the location to a new place. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then when the third person entered, they their personality changed the location. And, and so the locations themselves are actually changing with each new person entering them. And when, when I entered the first celestial spirit, uh, heavens, when I, I was still on the earth, but in the first celestial, in the, in the condition of a one man, again, my personality was reflected in that new condition of love in that dimension. And then when the next spirit, entered, which was Moses and Elias and different other spirits in the spirit world enter it, their personality changed what I'd created into a mixture of the both of us or the three of us or the five of us or the ten of us or the thousand of us or the hundreds of thousands of us, right? And so in the end, what happens, there's millions and millions of people who have entered that, seven, that eight sphere state now in the spirit world. And the, the, the spirit world it is different now than when I first entered it because it's a reflection of all of those combinations of personalities being reflected in that location. 
Do you follow me? Yeah. And so every new location gets created in that regard and every new place that as you progress. So when you change from the first to the second sphere here on earth, people in the second sphere in the spirit world know you've entered that condition. And they know because you changed it. You changed their place. You changed their surroundings. Their surroundings are different. A reflection of your personality that, that nobody else has ever had is now added to that, and they feel that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. are entering that sphere that then that will bring the, the um, level down? The well, the, the thing is that each sphere, um, you know, the first of the six spheres, um, each sphere is really, you could think of them as places of, um, what's the word, probation, if you like, um, where people have not yet learnt to love and, and, you know, they're in that location because they need to learn some things about love. And every single location is a place of probation, really. So, so when, when a person enters the sphere, they are automatically entering the location where their soul is already suited for. Right? So they're not bringing it up or bringing it down. They are actually in the location. So these locations now, particularly the, loca the higher locations, would all exist whether you are there or not now because somebody has already entered them and created them. So, you know, let's say all of a sudden something happened on Earth and everyone on Earth got into a first sphere condition and there was no one in any other condition. That doesn't mean the second sphere would no longer exist because the second sphere has already been created. It's a dimension that's already been created and already exists, whether people live in it or not. What I, what I would like to see happen myself, and one of the reasons why I've returned, is that there's a lovely uh, prophecy in the book of Isaiah which talks about the heavens being rolled up like a book scroll. And I've always interpreted that to mean that as, as the, the location here on earth changes in its, um, in, in its spiritual development, that eventually there'll be nobody on earth who passes into the spirit world in the first sphere. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And they'll all pass in the second sphere or greater. So mm -hmm. that means at that point that the first sphere will no longer need to exist. And I believe, my, my feeling is that when the first fear no longer needs to exist, it will disappear. So, so it will actually be rolled up, if you like, and, and closed. And then, let's say everyone on earth gets into a third sphere condition and everyone in the spirit world is above a third sphere condition, then I believe the second sphere will roll up. Right? And so all of these creations of these lower spheres below the six so the 5th, 4th, 3rd and 2nd and downwards, will all eventually be rolled up to the 6th. And I believe that in the end the 6th sphere will probably continue to exist for a long time, but the underlying spheres may not exist at all in quite a short time. Which will be beautiful, actually, because the majority of our problems here on Earth are caused by spirits in terrible condition interacting with humans, creating even more terrible conditions. So, yeah. Do you see a time frame on that? Do you think we see a major evolution happening about 2012? 2012 will be a triggers to a lot of these major evolutions. But, but the actual rolling up, you know, when people get into better conditions, I think that's going to take much longer. I believe in a few hundred years, man is going to be in a state of, like, um, where they'll either be in a sixth sphere state or in a celestial state. That's an understatement, isn't it? That would be good. <laughs> Sorry? Does that mean we're all going to be good or what? <laughs> <laughs> one, lady said, <laughs> one lady said to me, so we're all going to be God robots, are we, or something like that. Can we love and be there? The truth is that you all have unique personalities. And the problem is, is that we all express our personalities often through our injuries. And our injuries are nothing to do with our personality. So, so a lot of times what we do with our own progression is we hold on to this definition of ourselves that is actually an injury-based definition. Right? It's actually our emotional injuries that we're holding on to. If we let go of that, what we will be is our pure emotional condition expressed purely in, a, in, in harmony with all the laws of love. 
but we're not going to be robots. In fact, what happens is that you become more unique and more individual and more special. And the changes that are coming up on the earth are going to be quite uh, traumatic changes for, for most people because, because, and they are a direct result of the human soul condition. And, and those changes that occur on the earth will trigger emotional changes in people. And so this is why the 14 return at this time because it's such an important time in human history. And, 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 and it's like all, all the 14 are is like a catalyst to change. And so, so what will happen is that we will, we will change. Um, you know, when I say we, I mean all of you here will be a part of changing the world. But changing the world not in a sense of, um, you know, hammering out change, but because you're changing your soul condition, the world will automatically change as a result. And so, um, you know, the, the web of life, as you call it, um, will, will be retained if things, if man makes the choice to live more in harmony with love. The way God's created his universe, it's always self-correcting. So the web of life is never able to be lost, actually. And the reason why is because all of the laws of the universe result in the fact that it's impossible for anarchy to exist. Right? God is created, like, God is perfect. <laughs> we don't understand perfection. Most of us have got no idea what it really means, even when we're in the 22nd sphere state, because it's so, there are so many laws that govern God's universe, all based around love, that it's actually impossible to break them without there being some penalty attached to them and without there being some kind of corrective thing occurring. And the same goes with how you treat the earth. How we treat the earth results in its own penalties. The earth is a self-correcting system. And it will correct itself, as, and whether we allow it or whether we destroy, try to destroy it, it will correct itself. And the cataclysmic corrections that occur, which occurred like at the time of Atlantis, were, were caused by the human condition, by the, by the soul condition of man. So again, everything gets back down to the soul condition of man, the emotional condition. Can you talk a little bit how um, God created the universe? I have got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I can only suppose. But uh, I can tell you some things that I've supposed. Yeah. The reason why I've got no idea is because I wasn't there. And in fact, none of us were there. And, no, and this is what this Bible verse that I quoted at the beginning is very important to understand. God has put time indefinite into your heart so that you may never find out what the true God has done. Do you understand what that means? What that means is that you are going to investigate for the rest of your existence all the things that the true God has done and you are still not going to know them all. That's how much God has done, if you can contemplate that. Now, that all being said, God creates the same way you create and that is with your desire. So in other words, everything comes from God's soul. And the instant God desires, and, you'll, and even in your own progression, you'll see this start happening, particularly when you become at one with God. The instant you desire something that's harmonious with love is the instant that it's created. <coughs> and I'm not just talking about, like, um, you know, inanimate objects. I'm talking about even living things. So let's say you decide in your, that you really, really want to make a certain type of animal. Well, you will be able to actually form that animal and ask for God's spirit of life to enter that animal. And the spirit of life will enter that animal and you've now just created a new animal. And that animal will be unique because you're unique and whatever comes from your imagination. So God creates in a similar way in that he, he expresses his desire. He feels a desire, which is an emotion. And instantly, whatever he desired comes into being. Is that how the universe came about? 
everything, not just the material universe, but all the potentialities, of, even all the law. The, the, the reason why I'm so fascinated with law myself is because it's the law that creates the potential of the universe. Who created the laws? God. God, yeah. And this is what so fa much fascinates me about law, is that the laws were created before the universe existed. The laws were created for the spirit universe before that existed. The laws that were created for the soul, the human soul, all were created before the first human soul existed. And that's what fascinates me, is that God basically put in this... Um, any of you computer programmers? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you could liken it to God creating this, this structure and then everything inside of the structure gets created based on those, the structure's constraints. And uh, that's what God has done. It's actually immense. It's an, and it's an immense achievement when you think about that. And, and, and no spirit understands it. So what holds the space for God to be? For God to have those desires? I've got no idea. There's so many questions I can't answer to you. I can't, I can't answer even how, you know, what God's form is. I can only assume, based on what God's telling, teaching us through this experience, what God's form is. And, and so the, then the key thing for you, and, and to understand that even in the 20 seconds for your state, you will not be able to answer many of these questions because they are yet to be answered. Right? And uh, it's going to blow you away coming to try to answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, remember that individualization is the process of coming consciously aware of your own self, of your own existence and your ability to, have, to exercise free will. That's what individualization is. Personality existed before individualization in that God created you with certain unique character and attribute traits that are in no single other person, and that's your personality. And you're, you can modify your personality based on your experience. So, um, when you were conceived, that's when you individualised? The moment you're conceived is the moment you individualised. From that moment, you are now an individual who's able to express your free will. So if you're aborted, you now pass into the spirit world and you grow, just like any other child would grow, and you still have the ability to express your free will. The process of individualization has been complete. So, when you uh, decided to receive God's love, that was when the umbilical cord was cut. After the umbilical cord was cut, um, I was firstly cleared away of the emotional damage of my parents. So, that's only as a baby, right? Yep. So, how did you choose as a baby? Do you have a sense of that choice? When I, when I was two or three years of age, I started having a feeling about God, a feelings about God, feelings about God educating me, and I used to talk to God. I used to call, God was my, you know how children today have their friends, you know, that they chat, well, God was my friend, and I chatted to God out loud, much to my father's consternation, uh, to God in that manner from that time. So, so I talked to God, and I could feel God, I could feel God's responses, so I talked to God more, so I could feel this constant interaction with God from that age. And so, so from the age of three or four, I started to feel certain things. And of course, I was growing, and I'd never had a previous existence. So I, I just you know, slowly assimilated new truths using with that divine love that flowed into my soul because of that discussion with God. And, and that can happen to every single child uh, on earth now, even. Um, the same kinds of things can happen into that relationship. What happened is my father tried to suppress that. Um, so, but because I didn't have the emotional injuries, the damage, I didn't respond to that suppression. All right. So, so my father tried to suppress me talking out loud to God. Well, all I started doing was talking silently to God, and <laughs> he didn't know when I was talking then. But, um, but I still talked with God constantly. Yeah. So in in my soul, is this desire, this burning desire, this burning passion for truth. And, um, and, and, and that's uh, something that's been with me all my life. And my soulmate, I don't, she's still here, um, uh, calls me a truth nerd <laughs> because of that. Um, and, that, and, that and that desire, that passion has, um, 
has, has driven a lot of my connections with God. Every single one of you have unique passions. Some, most of which you've never discovered at this point, right? But they're unique, totally unique to you. Nobody else has, you know. And there'll be similarities, but there'll also be differences with others. And the passion that I have is, is for God and, and my connection with God. And there's a lot of reasons. Um, when we decided to reincarnate, um, we had to make a number of different choices. Um, obviously, uh, some of them were genetic-based choices. Some of them were experience-based choices. Some of them were related to emotional damage in parents that we needed to trigger certain memory-based emotions that we needed to experience or be choosing to experience. And some of it was about um, what locations on Earth would actually change them more rapidly. And, and in fact, six of the 14 have incarnated into Australia. And the reason why is because we feel that Australia is far more open emotionally and also far more open from a belief point of view to many other places in the Earth. And uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, uh, six of the 14 incarnated into Australia. There are other reasons too, in that it was a safe location. Um, you know, obviously there's not much point reincarnating and going through all the trauma and then passing within a few months uh, because of some bomb dropping on, on you or some, you know, terrible thing happening to your parents or something like that. So, you know, we had to also look at places that would remain quite safe uh, as well uh, for, for, for the duration of our lives until we become at one with God again. Yep. Yep. Why can't we all get that? Because God asked them to. But why, why can't he ask it to do it for everybody? Because he never does something if he doesn't need to. Well. well, no, God, see, God, one thing about God that you need to recognise is God is economical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. In other words, what, what, he's, what he does is he never does something that, he never does something again if he, like, when he does something once, it's done. He never needs to do it again. The reason why is because he never, like, why do it again when it's already been done once and the lessons have been learned and things are now progressing? Well, because we all, we, because we, um, we were separated by uh, the, the point of Adam and Eve due mm -hmm. to self-responsibility, mm -hmm. rather than God's being God's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And um, we, 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 as a human being, suffering and pain and trauma and Mm -hmm. Damage occurring, and if it can be done, why not do it to to to, to stop this? Um, to do it would be to undo the effects of um, of the laws of attraction and the laws of cause and effect. And God doesn't break His own laws. Um, so, so you did in your case. Well, there. When, in my case, there was cert a certain condition uh, in my parents' souls that created that event um, of the attraction of my soul in, in, into their life. Um, so it wasn't actually, it, it, everything that occurred to me occurred to me because of the law of attraction, not because of any other reason. Do you follow me? So even the clearing of the soul occurred to me because of the law of attraction. And I agree that in the future, your laws of attraction can also enable all of those things, just like my parents' law of attraction did. Right. So that is certainly possible, but God's not going to do it indiscriminately. So while I, what I've said may incline, you may then be inclined to believe that what it meant that it, it was done indiscriminately, I'm not meaning that at all. It was done because of the laws of attraction involved at the time. And those laws of attraction can operate now as well, if you want them to. But see, the reason why you're wanting that emotionally now is because you want to also avoid the emotional experience um, now. And, and God won't do that. God won't help you avoid your own emotional experience. So if your motive was more pure than that, there might be a different answer. But if the motive is for me to avoid my own emotional experience, what I'm actually basically saying is I want to avoid my soul. And God's not going to help you avoid your soul. He wants you to connect with your soul. 
right? So, so again, this gets down to purity and intention, right? If I have a pure desire, and when I say pure, it has to be harmony in harmony with all the laws of love, all the laws of divine love, right? So, if, and that implies every. So that means that every time I have a desire to avoid something, is my desire now pure? No. So therefore, am I going to get answered? No, not the way I want anyway. Yes, yeah. So basically, I think we're totally. walking around not feeling that connection. So yeah. if we ask for that help, it will help us. Yeah, and the truth is he's trying to help you with that already. But it's just a lot of times we don't realise the help that we're being given. Right? God's already trying to help you as best to, you know, as, as to what you can cope with. But a lot of times we're not responding anyway. But the truth is, you see, uh, there's a lovely uh, message in the Paget Messages um, and I didn't bring any C CDs with me, unfortunately, so I, was, I need to make some more copies and give these CDs out. But um, in the pageant messages, there's a message about cause and effect. And it says that God never answers a prayer that is a prayer about an effect. So in other words, if you want the effect of a decision to be taken away from you, God will never do that. <laughs> Right, so let's say you make a free will choice to enter a relationship and then and the relationship's with a specific person and then you pray to God that that person changes <laughs> to suit you. <laughs> That's never going to happen. God's not going to help that person change to suit you. You made a choice to enter that relationship because of a condition of your soul. You can pray from a pure desire to have the person change because they want to that's a different prayer and that is a prayer about our cause within them and that's a totally different thing but if you're wanting people to change for you then that's dealing with effects and that's not going to happen you're not going to get prayers answered that way right god only answers prayers dealing with emotional causes very important thing to remember right he only answers prayers dealing with emotional causes you can see why can't you like, what has man done now? Man has created this plethora of laws, right? Mm -hmm. And what do all these laws do? They actually, oh, like, somebody last week, you know, come up with a bad, bad example, perhaps. You know, somebody last week uh, drove their car off the edge of a certain cliff in a certain location. So what do they do next week? They change the law and they put barriers there so people in the future can't do that. Mm -hmm. like, God doesn't do that. Right? God only God looks at what caused this person to drive his car off the cliff. An emotion, wasn't it? Yeah. So deal with the emotion. Is there, is there that emotion in other people? Deal with that emotion in other people. That's what God would do. Right? And all of God's laws are all focused on you dealing with your emotions. All of them. So, AJ, yeah. you've got your work cut out for you in the US when it comes to the right to bear arms. The, but again, it's all based on soul condition. Why do they want a right to bear arms? Because they're afraid. Right? So you deal with the soul condition of fear and everyone won't any longer clamour to bear arms. They, they'll say, what the hell do we want these for? And they will turn their, arm, their, their you know, swords into ploughing shares, as the Bible says. They will change because they're of the emotional change. So... Yes, there is our work cut out for us in the sense that every one of us needs to change emotionally. That's the real work. When you change emotionally, your world will change. Right? Only when you change emotionally, not intellectually, emotionally, then your world will change. And that is a difficult work, and that, you know, but, but doesn't it appeal to you? Yeah. So if it appeals to you, don't you think it's going to appeal to other people too? Of course. Because it's soul truth, you know? Right? And it might really appeal to our soulmates. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get the Gee, there's so much to say about soulmates. <laughs> um. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, that's skipping along quite along in the discussion. What prevents us meeting them? Um, well, that's, yeah, yeah, that's a really important aspect. But first, let's understand the soulmate, shall we? They understand the relationship. And by the way, this is a whole, like I can spend hours and hours on this discussion, so I'll try and just give brief, I know nothing I say is ever brief. But, um, <laughs> remember that there's the soul and it incarnates, right? So that it splits into two. All right, so we've got our body, so that's the process of individualization complete. Now, can you see that the process of individualization affects both halves of the soul? Yes. Mm -hmm. In other words, the soul itself is the individual. Is that where in scripture they talk about male and female together makes man? That's it. And that would be yep. is it I am I am I am? Amon and Aman, yeah. It means male I am and female I am. The I am is the soul. The complete soul, not the two halves. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you are half of a soul. Now, I refer to you as soul condition and all those kind of things because it's easier than saying half of the soul all the time, right? Isn't it? But you are half of a soul. One half of a soul. You follow me? All right. Now, do you understand that firstly? Yes. So, I'm not sure. Um, spirit body, material body. Oh. Material body, spirit body. Oh. Right? So you are right now a soul encased in, or actually your soul encases a material body and a spirit body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Right. The same goes on the other side. Yep. So when we affirm, I am that, what are we doing? When I say, like, I am whatever, but it's all just words in the end. You still know that I am God and all those things. That yeah, well, you know, you can affirm, you can do affirmations all you like, but in the end it doesn't change what you really feel about yourself. Okay. What you feel about yourself is the real I am. Do you, do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah. yeah. Because it's very important to understand that. Yeah. No matter how much I intellectually try to force myself to be something, mm -hmm. it's what I really am that's inside of me that is going to be who I am. So what's the point in saying, you know, I am godlike, I am this, I am that. You are either that or not here, and whether you say it here or not. Okay. Right? So we need to all get real. Mm. <laughs> what is really here? You know, I'm sa am I saying to myself, I am godlike, when in reality I get angry every day? Well, that, is that godlike? No, so obviously I'm not godlike, right, <laughs> at that point. So I need to deal with what the truth is about my emotions. So that's very important. And that's understanding the soul, the half of the soul. This is the half. So let's say, so the way the soul gets individualization, this is the individual, and it splits into the two halves to gain individualization of its masculine and feminine sides. Right? Now I'm not saying they're masculine and feminine bodies, because they might be two males or two females that they incarnate into. Right? But they are masculine and feminine sides of their nature that are being developed. Right? So yes, there are homosexual souls, and yes, they, and they're not thought of that way, by the way, and yes, they incarnate into two bodies of the same, of the same type. All right? Is that shocking? Can you repeat that? Sorry. There are, there are souls that incarnate, when they split in their individuality, individualization process, they incarnate into two bodies that are identical in sex, in gender. So in other words, two female bodies or two male bodies. And, and around 10 to 20% of souls incarnate into, the, into that state. And it's, a, it's leading us away from the soulmate discussion. You want to know? Do you want to know? Well, this is why it does it. God creates everything with huge variety. So if you can imagine a graph, do you, do you like maths? No. Uh, if you can imagine a graph where this is neutral gender of the soul, and, and I'm talking about the complete soul now, right? And this is the swing between the soul being dominantly feminine and dominantly masculine, all right? 
then obviously what happens, I don't know if you know much about standard distribution and all those kind of things, right? But what actually happens is generally it's assumed that the 90% of the people will fall in the middle bracket, which you could say is a male-female combination of the soul. But on this end, it's going to be a female-female in its, in its earthly form, and on this end, it's going to be a male-male in its earthly form. Right? So in this case, the soul is predominantly masculine with some feminine char characteristics. In this case, the soul is predominant. The whole soul I'm talking is predominantly feminine with some masculine characteristics. And when it splits, of course, it splits into two bodies that represent its femininity. In this case, when it splits, it splits into two bodies that represent its masculinity. All defects in this process of incarnation result from soul damage in the parents or multi-generational soul damage. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why it's very difficult nowadays for people to determine even things like sexuality. Because a lot of times their feelings of sexuality are confused through the emotional injuries of their parents. So, for instance, if you grew up in an abusive environment, you're a female growing up in an abusive environment where you've been abused by men, obviously it's going to be very, very difficult for you to be open emotionally and vulnerable emotionally towards a man. And you might find it much easier to be open and emotionally vulnerable towards a woman, so therefore your sexual attractions go more towards women, even though at the soul level you may actually be a male-female soul. Right? And this is why it's so important to deal with the emotional injuries even for, in regard to sexuality. Does that cellular memory uh, pass through more than one generation? Um, remember, it's soul memory. It's actually based on the soul emotional conditions. And yes, it passes through all subsequent generations, unless it's cleared. Mm -hmm. so, so, for example, if I, gather, if I gather an injury right now and then I have a child who lives with me, that child will have that injury but in its soul. Souls. No, but remember the soul, in its pristine state, is without injury, and as soon as it incarnates, as soon as it incarnates into the pregnant woman, it's now gathering the injuries of its parents. So on a soul level? At so a soul it's level. A, so it's a transmission between the soul? That's right. And it's not on a physical level, and it's not on an emotional, it's on an emotional level, it's not even on a spirit body level, it's on an emotional level, the soul level. And then the physical bodies display the condition of the soul. So if the condition of the soul is a certain emotion of unworthiness that affects this area of the second chakra, then the person may grow to have bowel problems, for example, or have bowel problems at, at birth even. Right? Now those weren't, they are not inherited in the sense of inherited gen genetically. They are inherited because of the soul condition of the parents and the previous parents and the previous parents and the previous parents. And the very, very first emotion that all of us have is the emotion of self-reliance. Right? That's the one that was carried down all generations. But we're getting off the soulmate discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back. I know you've got a lot of questions. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of subsequent like, times that we discuss certain things will answer a lot of those questions. All right, where do we go from there? So I've, I've individualized, and my soulmate has individualized the beautiful creature that she is. Sorry? No, no. Often, uh, you know, one part of the soul will be dominant risk taker. Do you understand what I mean there? Like, so one half of the soul normally has a more of a risky person part of the personality. And usually it's that half of the soul that incarnates first. So, and they may incarnate 20 or sometimes even 30 years apart, but it's rare. Usually within 20 years apart, they incarnate. Where do the other half wait? They wait in the dimension that... Ha that uh, they, wait, they, they wait on the earth plane, around the earth, but in a dimension that's the soul dimension. So then they, are they aware? No. They're still unaware there? Still unaware, unless they're reincarnating. Yeah, they're totally unaware. If you're reincarnating, you're totally aware. Right? So, so you're totally aware of waiting and watching. What do you mean by risky? 
And the parts of their personality are adventurous, I suppose you could say. And, some, and when the soul splits, every single characteristics of the soul gets split into two, and some parts of the soul have more of it than the other. So if the soul has an adventurous nature by heart, but some, when it splits, one half will get a more of, of the adventurous nature than the other half. Mm. And that one will usually incarnate first. Probably spooning hairs, but why did they split? What, what causes the split? Um, a lot. Of, a, it's a lot about understanding masculinity and femininity. You see, God, God wants us to understand God, right? You know, that's all part. Part of all, the reason why God has done this is because He wants you to experience His love. How do you experience His love without knowing Him? So He also wants you to know Him, and the way He gets you to know Him is by doing with you what he needs to do to help you understand him. And part of it is when you split into two and you become male and female, you're starting to recognise, ah, oh, God's male and female, God's masculine and feminine qualities, right? There's a realisation that occurs. Maybe not. Maybe you think men are from Mars and women from Venus or something, right? <laughs> which is not true, obviously. But, but what actually happens is the two halves of the soul then start coming together. And in the end, you will actually, when you merge with your soulmate you'll, and become one, once you become one, you will actually understand everything about their experience and they will understand everything about your experience. So every man in this room will understand completely what it means to be a woman and every woman in this room will understand completely what it means to be a man if you have a male-female split. Right? And all of your memories you'll both remember when you're in the 20 seconds for your state. And the timing of the split, of the splitting of the soul, is that just coincidental? When you say timing, what well, do you...? The, first, the whole is, the soul is a complete unit, and then it splits. Why? And every soul has some instinctual attributes. One instinctual attribute is that it knows it must incarnate. <laughs> right? and, and so therefore it incarnates. Now, it incarnates because of the longings of its parents. And when I say longings, I'm talking about the soul longings, not the intellectual thoughts of the parents. So it's drawn to it's a particular, drawn set, of to a set, particular chooses, set of parents because of its personality. In effect, chooses, chooses parents somehow. Well, no, the parents are really choosing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But we've got off the soul, soul yeah. mess. So let's get back. All right, so we know we're two halves. Right. How many of you think you're an individual? I thought I was. <laughs> well, we're only an individual when we reach the 20 seconds for your state. But in God's definition, God's definition of individual is that complete soul totally, totally back at one with each other and at one with God. So that's the individual state. This state is about growing towards individuality but using this beautiful thing called free will to do so. Right. So this beautiful gift God gave you is this gift of free will. It's, it's such an unimaginable gift for, for, for pretty much all of us right, as to how much power is in this gift. It's a fantastic gift. A lot of people think it's a really bad gift <laughs> because uh, you know that person did that to me you know, and we get quite angry about these things. But the truth is the gift of free will is given to each soul, each half of the soul. And it's the half of the soul's desires from that point on that determines what happens with it and its soul mate. Every one of you have an instinctual uh, desire generally to partner, don't you? Now the only one, there are some of you who feel that you don't have an instinctual desire to partner and I can assure you that it's because of some emotional injuries that you picked up in your childhood. Right? And so inside of each one of your soul is a, an instinctual desire to partner. That is an instinctual desire. It's not always a realised desire. Yeah, but it is an instinctual desire that you all have. And the reason why that instinctual desire exists is so that God is teaching you something else. And that is that, hang on a sec, there is another half of me somewhere there. You know, so no matter how much psychobabble you get from all of these different things, 
you know, telling you that you are an individual and, you know, you don't need another person, which is very true, you don't need another person to be blissful. But God did create you with a desire to be with your soulmate. Many of you have a desire to be with your soulmate because of neediness. And I can totally connect with that because that was my problem. And, uh, and if you have a desire to connect because of neediness, then, then obviously that is an error-based emotion within yourself that you'll need to release. Because it's not about that. And you know how most of you feel sexual attraction to different people, right? So you might be going along merrily in your way and then all of a sudden just one person just stands out to you and you feel this sexual attraction. Well, that's not a soulmate attraction. But they could be your soulmate. Uh, it's probably highly unlikely. And the reason why <laughs> is, uh, there's a number of reasons why. I don't know what, if you understand what happens at the chakra level of your spirit body when you have emotional injuries. But what happens is you have certain energy. Energy enters your spirit form and, and keeps your material form going through the universe. And the chakra points, which are the energy meridians of your spirit form, which are controlled by the emotions in your soul, control how much energy enters different chakra points. So you know how you have your seven <coughs> primary chakra points and there's literally hundreds of points all over your body but the seven primary ones. If you can imagine, if I have an emotion of unworthiness then I have this emotion here in the second chakra point quite in infected with this unworthiness. And so I'll be trying to draw energy in in this chakra point from others. Does that make sense? Well, I've got that emotion of unworthiness. Now that's very, the second chakra is also very much connected to sexual identity. So, if there's energy flowing into the chakra point, I'm also going to feel horny. You follow me? Yep. So, I'm walking around like this, with this emotional injury. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not walking around horny. I'm just... <laughs> anyway, so what happens is I walk up to somebody and that other person is willing to actually satisfy this feeling of emotional injury that I have of unworthiness by trying to make me feel worthy, right? Which will be based on their emotional Which will be based on their emotional injury of wanting to, you know, you know, nurture someone, mother someone, whatever, right? And particularly if it's want to mother them, it's going to come probably from their second chakra. So, so here I am, I've got this second chakra injury with no, not much energy flowing until it goes around and I meet that person. Wow, you know, there's, there's some second chakra flowing energy flowing between the two of us now. You follow me? Yeah. And so you know what's going to happen? I'm going to feel horny. <laughs> I'm going to feel sexually attracted to this person. And it's got nothing to do with my pristine soul state. It's got everything to do with the injury yeah. being satisfied in the, in, energetically from an emotion. When that second chakra is flowing Yeah, you get to a point where you do not need you don't need any sexual desire and you'll instantly recognise who your soulmate is, not because of any sexual desire. So is that similar to the ideal of tantric sex as in developing that as an expression of energy as opposed to a physical oh gee, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> tantric sex is not an expression of anarchy. Uh, but Ta tantric sex? You, did you say an expression of anarchy? No, uh, an expression of energy, energy. as in like energy is flowing. <laughs> right. I knew what I thought about it. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> I just got it wrong. Um, so, uh, tantric, tantric sex um, is certainly an expression of energy and it's about opening up all of the chakra points while you're making love with somebody, right? And, and certainly when you're with your soulmate and you've cleared away all emotional damage, all sex will be tantric. Right, um, and that, and you, you also need to understand that every time you enter a relationship, you create a third being, in a way, because you're creating that. It might not be with your soulmate, but it's with somebody, and you're creating this third entity, if you like, which is an amalgamation of the two entities, mm -hmm. and it's an amalgamation of the two of you emotional condition, whether they be injury based or pure, just it doesn't matter which one does it. It's going to in 
Now, the problem is with attraction is that the attraction, if I've got emotional injuries, is going to be all based on whether our emotional injuries are compatible. And do I want it to be that way? Really? Don't I want it to all be based on purity and it actually be my soulmate? Right? So that's an important thing to bear in mind. Now, as you work through your emotional injuries and you work through the issues of masculinity and femininity in particular, you will get to a point where you attract your soulmate automatically into your life. And just last week I was talking with a lady and, and, uh, and she's going through this terrible up, emotional upheaval at the moment. She met her soulmate for the first time, she's, I think she's in her 50s, and she met her soulmate for the very first time uh, a few weeks ago and since then she's been crying every day. <laughs> He's rejected her and she, he doesn't even know who she is, in fact. Uh, and the reason why she's been crying every day is because the moment you meet your soulmate, if you have unresolved emotional injuries, you're going to get them triggered full on. So it's not going to be a smooth relationship. It's actually going to be quite a tumultuous one unless the both of you are willing to deal with your emotions fully, fully choose your emotions. Does that mean if we've had a fairly smooth relationship, we're not with really <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't mean that. The majority of people on earth do meet their soulmates. And in fact, the majority of, a lot of people on earth do marry their soulmates. And it's just that they don't, are not yet aware of the soulmate relationship and their injuries were compatible enough to attract each other. You follow me? So even though they are in a relationship, it doesn't mean they're in a soulmate relationship yet. They're only going to be in a soulmate relationship once they've both worked through their injuries. Yeah. That's when the true relationship begins. So a lot of spirits say when they pass, they say, I now know you're my soulmate to, a, to their partner who was on the earth who they lived with for 40 years. Right? And in fact, this happened to Paget, uh, James Paget, who we channeled through. He, he, he had, had a partner, soul, a soulmate, whose soulmate he married. He didn't know until she passed. And she started realising when she passed that she was his soulmate and that she loved him more than what she realised love was available to her on earth. And it's about entering that relationship. So don't think that because you're sexually attracted to somebody that it means you're soulmates. And in fact, if you recognise injuries within yourself, there's a pretty good chance you're not soulmates, you're injury mates. <laughs> Even if you're in the spirit world and your soulmate's here, or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on you. Again, depends on you becoming at one with God, really. Because once you're at one with God, you can interact with any being on any in any condition. So if your soulmate's passed over and he's in the hills and you happen to be at one with God but living on earth, you'll be able to establish a relationship or some kind of rapport with him or her. You know when you are with someone, male or female, just like friends, and you have an instant click with them, yep. is that just because you're in the same soul condition as them? Uh, there's a combination of factors. Probably you've already met in the spirit world. Uh, every, night, every night you go to sleep, you enter the spirit world. And you set up things for the next day for yourself. You do all sorts of things in the spirit world that you're not conscious of in your awake state. One of those things is meet people that you would want to meet in your life state. So when you have a feeling of, oh, I've met you before, more than likely you've met the person in the sleep state. How many people have felt that you've met me before? Could quite a lot usually say that. And it's true, we probably have met before, but in the sleep state. Yep. What happens in the case of twins? Are they solid? No, okay. not generally. not generally soulmates. That doesn't mean it's not possible. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, you mentioned if we're here and the other person's passed over and they're in the hell, mm -hmm. we have a relationship with mm -hmm. them. So I don't understand how... Would you want one? <laughs> <laughs>
Exactly. Pure clearing that. Exactly. Very difficult, isn't it? I'm saying it's possible, but it's probably not going to happen if they don't want to clear away any of their emotions. Well, yeah, this is, ve this is something that I've really struggled with even this, this time around in particular, is, is when I met my soulmate, then struggled with the desire to want to help her. And, and, and so much so that it's actually pushed her away from me, really. Um, so um, the, the key thing is to, is to focus on, do they want your help? If they don't want your help, then it's wise to not give it. It's wise to wait until they want it. Yeah. Whether, whatever the condition they're in. If, if they come from the one soul, mm -hmm. is, is there free will in any way? Or, like, Certainly. Like, so, will they naturally orientate towards the same thing at a certain point? Certainly. Will they, what, I'm, yeah. Yeah. what happens, what happens is, the, when we talk about free will, it's actually the free will of the complete soul that is the free will. And this is why sometimes soulmates meet their soulmate partner and then no longer feel like they've got free will anymore. And the reason why is because they feel like they're getting drawn or sucked along, <laughs> right, <laughs> against their will. And that happens quite often and then there's a big rebellion about that often because people are so self-reliant that they rebel against going along with somebody else, right? So that often happens where a soulmate will meet their soulmate partner the soulmate partner might be further developed and then they feel like they're being sucked along right, against their will and so firstly they're going to need to work through their emotions. Firstly they need to work through their emotions as to why that's occurring because in the end they won't mind doing that. Like I'd love to be sucked along by my soulmate rather than, <laughs> rather than, rather than doing anything different to that. But, but if you've got an emotion about it, it'll be an emotion of self-reliance, you know, a misinterpretation of what it means to be an individual. Is the relationship with your soulmate different than having a good relationship with someone that you're on the same yeah. spiritual journey with? Totally different. Because if your soulmate's in the hell realms or whatever, it just seems like why would you bother? Oh, There's of course. Already someone who if you've got a soul, if you've got a relationship where, uh, let's say, let's say right here on Earth. You're in quite a good spiritual condition. Let's say you're in first, second sphere condition, but you know, like, like, so you've learnt lessons of love already. But you meet your soulmate, and he's a drug-using addict who who surfs all day and doesn't do anything else. And it's going to be very, very hard for you to have a relationship, right? So, so what do you do? Do you choose to have a relationship with him, or do you choose to give the help that you can, and actually stay single? Or do you enter a relationship with another relationship and have a relationship while you're waiting for him? Well, that's up to you, really, what you do. And that relationship will certainly be better if he's at the same level as you, growing spiritually, than the relationship of having a relationship with your soulmate. It'll be more fulfilling. But what normally happens <laughs> is different. What normally happens is once you become conscious emotionally, once you've worked through the emotions of the soulmate relationship, and become conscious of that emotionally, it becomes impossible for you to have a relationship with anyone else but your soulmate. And that's the state I've been in for nearly six years. So, what that means then, is when you meet your soulmate, all of these needy emotions have a habit of surfacing as a result of that, right? And you need to deal with all of those emotions. Yeah. So, so you will often feel, you will get to a stage where you have some emotional realisations when and I, and I was talking to a lady in, uh, in Texas the other day. She rang up because she was crying about her soulmate. And she knows who her soulmate is and they had brief discussions. And then he's just rejected her. And she's working her way through all of these different emotions to do with self-love and everything, being blissfully happily without her soulmate. And as she's working through those emotions, which ironically have to happen to be the same as the emotions I'm working through, um, she, she, start, she started coming to terms with a lot of the feelings of how to be in bliss without having a partner. And she's realised she's, she's in a marriage, which was breaking up already because of her husband's infidelity. And, and so she realised that even though she's breaking up with her husband, she doesn't have a desire now to have any other relationship, even though her soulmate has rejected her. Because she doesn't feel inside of herself that it's going to be possible to do that. 
and I certainly feel that myself. Like I, I've felt like that for nearly six years now. That it's not possible for me to have a relationship uh, with anyone other than my soulmate. Which of course has brought up lots of emotions. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what are, what's it like then if you're with your soulmate? How is that different than when you're with just a good relationship? Um, you mean in an environment condition or do you mean just when you're with your soulmate no matter what condition? Because they're two different states. So you, can you imagine like when you're with your soulmate in, in a condition that's not yet at one with God, obviously you're in different emotional states, right? So let's say it might be, you know, the female half of the soul might be ahead of the male in terms of the condition of love, let's say, or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. If that's the case, then obviously if two people are in different conditions of love, this person's going to think what love is is a certain thing, when it's not. And this person's going to know more about what love is and understand more about what love is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be, naturally, some conflicts unless both are fully choosing their own emotion. So the key is, is your emotion, is your soulmate going to fully choose every single emotion? Because if they're not, then it's going to be impossible for you to be together, really, isn't it? Because what's going to happen is you'll trigger them and they'll trigger you, and if both of you are not fully choosing, one of you is going to get upset with that, which is going to create anger. Remember, every time we deny an emotion, we get into an anger state generally, and off we go with that. And in the end, the other one's going to say, well, hang a sec, you're going to get angry with me all the time. I can't be with you. Right? So it's going to cause a separation of the relationship. Now, if you're talking about what it's like in an one condition with God, well, that's totally different. Obviously, both of you no longer have any emotional injuries. So obviously, the, there's going to be a blissful <laughs> relationship, even without the soulmate relationship being a part of it. And it's an incredible relationship. And you will see that relationship demonstrated on Earth. And many of you will actually enter those relationships over the coming years. But then why did you say, you, I mean, you, you obviously would be able to have that, but yet you would wait for a soulmate that's not... Because there's this feeling inside of me that I can't have a sexual relationship with anybody unless she's my soulmate. I don't want to. It doesn't feel real. Sorry? It just doesn't feel real. Um, there's, there's even, there is even things like emotionally, it's impossible for me to do it in, in terms of emotionally. And because it's impossible emotionally and I'm so connected to my emotions, physically it's impossible to even make love to a person who's not my soulmate for me. Does that make sense? Eventually, yeah. yeah. But it's about clearing away the emotional damage before the memory. So that's, in other words, I must allow, the, remember, all the memories of the soul are emotional, are to do with, like, connections with emotions. So if you refuse to deal with an emotion, you will not remember. It's a bit like your own childhood. If you refuse to deal with emotions in your own childhood, you will not remember certain events in your childhood. Does that make sense? So, and if you choose, if you choose to not deal with your emotions, there's whole slices of your life you won't remember. And it's the same in terms of a reincarnated person. If they choose to not deal with certain emotions, there's whole slices of their life they will not remember until they deal with those emotions. Is that why we always remember the good things and we forget the bad things? Exactly. We are selective. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very dangerous for the soul to be, for that, because the soul wants to be totally open and free with all emotion. You cannot enter a state of atonement with God being selective. So, so someone who's had a lot of Yep. You don't so much have to re-experience the abuse itself, but you do need to experience all of the emotions the abuse created. So not necessarily the memories. Um, the emotions. You need to do the emotional work, yes. The memories will come along, actually. What will happen is as soon as you're willing to do the emotional work, God can help you. See, uh, it's important to understand again the soul. When you block your soul from experiencing emotion, God cannot help you. Can you see why? Because the emotions are you. And if you're blocking your emotions, how can God's love influence you in any way? It can't, because what's love? An emotion. It's God's emotion, but it's an emotion. So how, how can God's love influence you if you're blocking your own emotion? If you help he, he can't help you to unblock. That is a choice of your own soul. 
He can assist you in external ways, which he's always trying to do, but he can't forcibly unblock your soul because that would be against the laws of free will. So if we, I mean, you know, we're not young, well, I'm not young, so it's, it's been years of these blockages mm -hmm. to actually unravel that. How do we actually do that? Well, firstly, you need to have a desire to do it yeah. and generate within yourself a desire to actually unravel everything and become real with everything. And we can talk at other times, because it's starting to get pretty late now, about about how to unravel things emotionally. Yeah. How do we know that we're actually experiencing causal emotion and that it's not just a uh, A number of ways, but firstly, the law of attraction will instantly change. So when you experience a causal emotion, you will instantly see the law of attraction change in your life. Remember that example I gave you earlier with me on the plane? Right? And when I experienced that causal emotion that created the event where I didn't get fed, automatically I got fed without asking for it. So if I've got an issue that comes up, keeps coming up every day, mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm um, dealing with it, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm not good enough, I'm really bawling and crying about it, but mm -hmm. it's still happening, is that because... There's something missing in the processing that you're not let allow, yet allowing yourself to experience. Now, it might be a simple thing like recognising uh, just a basic, some basic things about where it came from, for example, that you need to recognise to make the next step. Or it might be some things that you're not admitting to yourself. And how will I <coughs> sort of work that out? The law of attraction will always, will always <coughs> already be showing you the things you're missing. And it's not being open to it. You just, yeah. And this is, like, I'm, I'm the worst offender, right? <laughs> For the law of attraction showing me something that I'm missing. Like, how do I stay in a relationship for seven years that's harmful? Crying every day. Because I'm blind to the law of attraction. Right? That's how I did it. And we often do this. So let, let yourself see everything. Let yourself see everything. Now, everyone's getting pretty tired. I can feel that. <laughs> So I think it's yeah best to leave it off now. Um, there'll be another, the next session that we're having is uh, August 30, I think it is. Um, and as Grant's already mentioned, to write names down or whatever if you want to come. Uh, I'm not sure of the subject yet of the next session, but next session there'll be less, probably less uh, audience participation and I'll present a subject more directly and then we'll have the times for questions after I've presented the subject. Yeah. Do you have any written material, AJ, about...? Uh, yeah, I'm in the process of putting together lots of written material, but it's just taking a bit of time with my own processing. But there's already written material on a website. Uh, What's the website? www.divinetruth.com And uh, there's also a, a CD, uh, which I'll get copies made for you. Of today? No, a CD, not the DVD of today, but the CDs of, of information and material. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.